everyone. Uh, we have a special event today. We continue our series of uh, events dedicated to uh, the current uh, presidential election in, in, in America. And today we will uh, discuss the very interesting topic, uh, namely LGBT issues and elections, um, something which uh, seems like a very tiny thing, but I hope we'll see that it's not actually so tiny that we, we, can, uh, we can say many interesting things about it, and it's very important. Uh, so please think, as you listen to our guests speaking, please think of your questions and then engage in a lively discussion. Uh, I'll introduce our guests now. We have uh, Mrs. Kamala Wells and Mr. Paul Brian Robinson. Uh, just by listening to their names, you already know that they're Americans. Uh, who live in Poland for a time already. And they're both, uh, you could say, practitioners because they're both LGBT activists, so there are people who deal with those issues on a daily basis. And they're both also very interested in politics, and we'll, so we'll, 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 uh, we're about to hear a very interesting talk at first, and then and then uh, discussion. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming our guests for this event today. Here and, and Patrick asked to, you know, do you need a, do you need, do you have PowerPoint? Do you need slides? And both of us immediately thought, oh no, we don't have, we don't have visual aids, so we feel slightly naked that we're just here having a casual talk with you. But hopefully, you know, we we will be entertaining enough. Um, maybe maybe you'd like to hear just two or three sentences about Paul and about myself. You know that we live in Poland. You know that we're LGBT activists. But um, Paul, what? Who are you in three sentences? Um, well, I'm, I'm a vet. I was in the United States Marine Corps uh, a while ago, about 20 years ago. Um, wrote through television, and I make video games. And uh, I try and help out the community around the world. So that's basically who I am. Okay. Uh, how long have you not lived in the States? I have been out of the States, I think, since... 2006 was the last time I permanently lived there. Although I am a good American, I go back to visit Mother for Thanksgiving, Fourth of July, and all that, and keep very much in tune with what's going on back home. Uh, so, good um, American expat. Yeah, I'm the bad American. Um, I haven't lived in the States for 25 years. Uh, I do go back, but usually every two years. My family is all still there. Um, I used to be an artist, and then I retired, um, and now I work in finance. So I also, as much as I can, before I, I worked with doing financial stuff, but with uh, NGOs, uh, organizations, organizations, and um, whenever I can, I sometimes write for Replica Magazine, and am pretty regularly involved, although less than I used to be, in a lot of feminist activities and um, demonstrations and stuff like that. So. That was more than three sentences. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so, so we're, Paul is going to try not to go into too much detail, because he's a good American, he knows everything about politics, and he just automatically knows this stuff. So he's going to try not to go too much into detail, <laughs> and I'm going to try not to embarrass myself by how much I don't know. But if we're talking about something that you completely, you know, we're going off on a tangent, or we start talking about a person that you have no idea what we're saying, just somebody raise your hand, and we'll either stop or explain it. Okay? Okay. <laughs> um, so, uh, 20 years ago, if a Republican was talking about somebody LGBT, which then would just be called gay, then probably the word that would be used is sodomy. Right? The Democrats weren't a lot better. We have to think, like 23 years ago, in 1993, is when uh, Don't Ask, Don't Tell was proposed uh, for the American military, which was considered to be a kind of compromise. It was supposed to be a way to allow every citizen to serve by allowing them to not be asked if you're gay. If, we don't, if, you, if you don't say that you're gay, we won't ask that you're gay, and that way you can stay in the military. Paul can talk a lot more about this if we want to, um, but you know that, that was 25 years ago, 23 years ago that that was 
instituted, and it was repealed in 2010. Uh, 20, 20 years ago, 1996, DOMA was uh, instituted, the Defense of Marriage Act. And again, this is kind of considered to be a compromise because in 1993, what, what DOMA was is it allowed the states to refuse to recognize same state, same sex marriages. And this came about, and this is a federal thing, because as you know, like each state gets to do what they want, but then if there's a federal law, then everybody has to follow this. 1993, there was a case in Hawaii uh, where it didn't actually say that same-sex marriages were okay, but it had some information in there that was like a precedent saying the state should have a very good reason why it doesn't allow same-sex marriages. This is in Hawaii, and everyone across the state started panicking, especially people who opposed same-sex marriages, because there's also something in the Constitution that says it's the full faith and credit clause, which says if you have a document from one state, especially like legal document, judiciary document, then all the other states have to recognize it. So, you know, if you're born in New York and you go to Wyoming, you're still born, right? You get married in one state, you go to another state, and they have to abide by this. So, the Defense of Marriage Act in 1996 um, was kind of a federal panic button where they wanted to make sure that if somebody got married in Hawaii, whenever, whichever first state said it's okay to get married, that they couldn't move to another state or, or try and get federal benefits or fed, like on a, on a full nationwide. So that's the kind of background, that's 25 years ago, that those were the kind of situations, and th that was, those were both uh, enacted under Bill Clinton, right? So we've got Hillary Clinton running now, Bill Clinton, they're both considered to be, you know, like the avant-garde and like defenders of LGBT uh, rights, but that was the situation 20, 25 years ago. So now, uh, it's really, really different. The LGBT population hasn't drastically changed. We still have, you know, a statistically 5 to 10 percent of the population that is LGBT, but it seems like the movable middle has moved. And what I mean by the movable middle is that, like, you always have people that are pro or very pro something, and people who are con or very, you know, against or very against something. But there's always this big group of people in the middle who kind of go, well, it's none of my business, or I don't really care. And it's those people that maybe 20, 25 years ago were like, I don't care, but no. And now they're kind of, I don't care, but everyone should have rights. So just as a background to where we are today, like how did that, you know, we, how do we go from that kind of situation to now, where in the last 10 years we've had amazing, amazing changes in the kind of rights for LGBT people that most people wouldn't have really imagined, like five or 10, you know, like 20 years ago. Just even though the Clintons now, well particularly Hillary, is saying that she was for the Defense of Marriage Act as a kind of compromise to kind of protect things. No matter what people thought personally, the political situation was really like a no-go area for LGBT rights. Um, so now, we have 2015, and Obama is the first president ever on the cover of a gay magazine, Out Magazine, he was named Ally of, of the Year. Um, but even for him, in 2004, when he was running for the Senate, he said that marriage is something that should be between a man and a woman. So we kind of have to consider when we're thinking about LGBT candidates now, or not LGBT candidates, candidates for the election now, that all of them, probably in the length of their career, have, as all politicians do, change their mind, take a different stance, and there's some kind of history behind that. So um, what we're going to do today um, is introduce the candidates, the five main candidates for uh, president. That are in the running, and um, talk uh, not to talk about everything with their candidacy, but just to talk about how they relate to LGBT uh, rights, and then talk a little bit about the current situation, about where the voters and organizations stand. So, um, Paul's going to start with Bernie. Bernie right, Sanders. Right. So, so uh, <laughs> full disclosure, I've I've been following Bernie Sanders. Um, <laughs> a lot longer than his presidential candidacy. Bernie Sanders uh, started out as a dark horse, uh, most definitely. Um, it was a, a social justice movement, obviously. 
But one of the interesting things I find about Bernie Sanders, especially where his connection and his ties to the LGBT community uh, stems from, is he wasn't always a big supporter of the LGBT community, especially when it came to uh, marriage rights and marriage equality, but he also, when we're speaking of that middle ground, wasn't necessarily against it. He did stand against uh, uh, marital rights for a long time, but he did change his stance about 10 years ago, uh, as Vermont itself is a pretty progressive state, and he was a pretty progressive uh, candidate and then elected a senator. So, so he has shifted gradually towards that movement. But what I find uh, interesting about him, especially now, he's right now in the election, he's full on non supporting, he's far to the left of LGBT rights right now. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do on a personal level with Bernie. I've met him twice in my life. Um, has to do with Rachel Maddow, who's an American talk show host, and probably one of the most influential uh, lesbians in media in America right now, especially in the political sphere. And she did more over the eight years that uh, Obama in particular has been president to, to sort of get him front and center as a, a viable candidate, but also as one that reached out to the, the LGBT community in America, because he was pretty much always known as a financial warrior, uh, an economy warrior, the guy that was, you know, the irascible guy challenging everyone in the Senate on his social democratic approach to, you know, income equality, but he was pretty much unknown to the LGBT community, and he's still relatively unknown to most communities of, of color in the states, LGBT or not. So that's kind of where he is. So right now he's trailing by about, a, you know, almost a million and a half, two million votes. Uh, Hillary is far in advance of all the other candidates in terms of popular votes. But he does have a chance to actually, especially if the superdelegates come around to him, get the nomination. Now, part of this is all politics. You know, Polish politics is crazy, so is American politics. But, you know, in America right now, he started out very much, I hate the superdelegates. Now he's looking at the math going, well, maybe I don't hate them so much because they can get me the nomination, which is just the, the nature of political of political beast back home. Um, but but with Bernie, I mean, one of the things with him is, is regardless of whether he's won or not, for special economic issues and social justice issues, he has changed the conversation, not just in America, but globally. Um, all of my friends in Europe and all of my friends in Asia, and I talk to a lot of them, know more about Bernie, who was the considered dark horse candidate in the States, than they knew about the other candidates other than Trump. We don't want to talk about him that. That's on, on uh, Pamela. But other than Trump, Bernie is probably far more recognized globally um, as, a, as a presidential candidate. Hillary obviously been around for her various roles as Secretary of State. But I think that's kind of, in relation to the LGBT community, kind of where he is. Um, but like all politicians, he kind of gets controversial. We, we're still sort of parsing this Vatican visit uh, with, Pro, with uh, Francis. Did he meet him, or was it a Kim Davis thing? We're still figuring that one out. Um, that That's kind of him in a nutshell. Um, I don't know what more to say about him, unless I go into his, you know, mom on history, because I know a lot about her um. civil rights. Lack thereof, mm -hmm. 70s, his stance on the war, all that stuff. He has been doggedly consistent, I will say, with most of his politics, but that consistency has been kind of not translated into policy, which is mm -hmm. one of the downsides of Bernie. He's a very much an activist kind of guy, but his policy record relative to a lot of the other sen senators and congressmen have been has been pretty slim for 25 or 30 years of service. So it's kind of him in that show. Okay, so, so for now, does anyone have any specific questions about Bernie? Okay, um, moving on to Hillary. <laughs> um, by the way, okay, so the and five... our boys does boys, girls does girls. No, 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 we're not doing boys. Um, <laughs> just, just to let you know, um, the candidates that we're covering are um, the two Democratic the two that are fighting for the Democratic nomination, which is Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton. The three that are fighting for the re Republican nomination, which is Ted Cruz, Donald Trump, and John, I want to pronounce it in the Polish John way. John Kasich. Kasich. I always want to say Kasich. <laughs> um, and then there's two independent characters. So, so one of the, the Democrats is going to get in 
is going to be on the ticket, one of the Republicans, and then there's also Gary Johnson and, mm -hmm. and Jill Stein. Maybe hmm? two. I'm Wait. looking forward to the. Oh GMB yeah, election. yeah, I know. Who knows? <laughs> Donald Trump is a is a complete like you know crazy person. So, so so yes, one of them will be on the ticket as a Republican candidate. The other one, who knows? <laughs> um. So right. So, uh, Hillary Clinton. I think you know most people know she was Secretary of State. She uh, was a Senator of New York. She was quite a visible part of Bill Clinton's two, two, um, can, two presidencies. presidencies. And she, according, they, 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 they do these kind of um, liberal or conservative polls. Con according to these polls, she's less liberal than Bernie. Like Bernie gets a, gets a standing of, of 8.2, and she only gets uh, 6.5. Um, really her track record on supporting LGBT rights and women's rights is, is really long. Um, she's, she's definitely a professional politician and she's definitely been in a lot of messes, um, but in terms of LGBT rights then she really goes back quite a way. Most of the, you know, there, there's a couple I can, I can say just in the last year, let's say, uh, in, in June last year, you know, she was very, very vocal about supporting when the, the um, is it pronounced Obergefell? Obergefell. Obergefell and, uh, versus Hodges. This is the case that overturned the Defense of Marriage Act and made it so that same-sex marriage is legal and widely recognized in all across America. So she was you know, very, very outspoken, um, but you know, most of the nation was. By that time, it was very hip. You know, even the White House turned rainbow. Um, in July 2015, then she she was endorsing the uh, Equality Act, and which is still in progress. This is an expansion of the 1964 Civil Rights um, Act, which is looking to add LGBT people as part of the anti-discrimination uh, protection. So uh, this is you know, she's she's come out of course in, in support of this. Um, in 2015, in October, then she, you know, even though she was involved in the Clinton administration when Don't Ask, Don't Tell was in, was, uh, in put in, into action and also with defense of marriage, then she's actually since then worked a lot to try and repeal these and to say that, okay, that was a mistake, let's you know, stop this. So she's arguing in, in October that about 14,000 soldiers that were forced to leave the military because of their sexual orientation should have their records, service, service records, uh, kind of updated, and they, you know they should be honored. Um, so she's working for LGBT veterans' rights. In December, then, um, you know she she's. It's not it's not the only incident, but there's like scenes from speeches where she's always like has been repeating, you know, gay rights are human rights. So she's very outspoken uh, in a public way in the last year and a half, which is not so surprising since she wants to be president. But um, not included in, mo in most of the kind of pro-Clinton statements is the fact that, that as long ago as 1991, which is like 25 years ago, then uh, you know she and and her husband were doing a lot about uh, HIV and AIDS awareness, and she was really really a big supporter and putting money towards this, and um, in 1991, then there was uh, someone that she, she knew very close who was involved in Los Angeles, a project in Los Angeles, who died. She was asked to speak at his, at his memorial, and she did. So even, you know, 25 years ago, then she was involved, not just in some of the more popular issues, because now it's becoming kind of hip to be pro-marriage equality, but marriage equality is not the only issue on the table. You know, there's still HIV and AIDS is an issue. There's a lot of stuff about about transgender bullying, about bathroom laws, about you know a lot of other kinds of things. So, um, in October, Advocate magazine, which is a, a, a gay magazine, LGBT magazine, interviewed her, and and for them they said she was like tepidly tolerant. So so you know a lot of times she comes across as a very professional politician. But still, um, I think, I think in terms of the community, then you could say that the community, maybe the community, if there is such a thing, um, is kind of split over their kind of support of Bernie or Hillary. She's she's really loved. Some people say that she's the kind of uh, you know 
political share um, that you know a lot of people see in her the fact that she she's really strong and gets a lot of stuff thrown at her and she stands up to it you know so there's something that they kind of recognize that she really gets a tough time like people have dedicated their entire working life to destroying the Clintons and they're still standing she's still there you know she she gets so much mud thrown at her and still she's like I don't care I'm here so I think because of that then that's one thing that, that the LGBT community and especially I would say the you know women uh, less maybe economically powerful the you know there, there is a little bit of a divide maybe you can say between the supporters or, or, or who she stands up for she stands up for everybody but maybe uh, she's more popular with um, with the not white upper class middle men <laughs> um, so so yeah she she has lots of uh, maybe not lots but she has several gay staff these gay people on her staff her campaign manager Robbie Mook is is a um, she also has a dedicated LGBT outreach um, that's on her as part of her campaign that's that's of course headed by someone by this guy Dominic Lowell. Um, she she announced her candidacy with a video that included not one but two gay couples. Um, she has uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the the, the PACs the political action committees. committees. She she has the kind of L PAC which is quite a, a power group. It's the lesbian power group. <laughs> Um, that are lobbying for her, so she has a lot of um, a lot of people that are working with her and on her team that are not only working for LGBT rights but are um, in the camp. So I think you know, of course, she she regularly tweets about about stuff. She's you know, all of them are big into into making sure that they are seen publicly as opposing something or, or supporting something. So actually, it was the 1st of April, there was um, in um, Indiana, there's like the Arkansas passed, mm -hmm. yeah, they did pass it. They passed something similar to Indiana's Religious Freedom Act, and you know, so of course she kind of came out and said. 12 states now. 12, yeah. Um, so I mean, you guys all know that the Religious Freedom Acts mean that they're free to discriminate. So, um, so that was kind of the latest. So I think that's that's Hillary in a nutshell. Uh, Ted Cruz. Senator Ted Cruz. Full disclosure. <laughs> do not like Senator Ted Cruz. <laughs> um, uh, mainly, so so one of the things, one of the reasons why is I met a young Ted Cruz maybe 12, 13 years ago. I had the, the great honor of interviewing. Um, for another magazine, Governor Ann Richards of Texas. He was probably the greatest governor of Texas that had in the past 50 years. She was a great, great, great woman. Um, and was also very much um, in support of LGBT, LGBTB issues from back in the day. Uh, just to sort of bring the connection to why I was talking and meeting all these politicians is when I got out of the military, um, I actually was in a, in a they call it queer vets back in the day, a group um, challenging Don't Ask, Don't Tell. I was doing a lot of uh, activism, writing for this uh, LA magazine called Frontiers, standing up for vets who were getting in trouble and getting picked out because of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Because even though it was a compromised position, it was the first time in the history of the US military where there was a codified law that, that a commanding officer could use to kick people out of the military for their orientation before. The reason that usually happens is if you signed on your form, I have, and, and the form was very ridiculous. It didn't ask if you were gay or lesbian or whatever. It asked about what your sex was with someone of the same sex. And if they determined that you had lied on your entry form, then that was the reason that they could kick you out over orientation if you ever saw the movie Deloxy Blues. Um, don't ask, don't tell. Actually, made a law that was used that command officers could use. Could use. So, um, I met Ann Richards defending and um, trying to defend this airman that was about to get kicked out of the Air National Guard, who was in LA lobbying some of the groups. And she, had, she wasn't a governor, but she was supporting veterans in the sense who were, who were in the struggling under Don't Ask, Don't Tell. And I went down to Texas to meet her, and I had the misfortune of meeting a young aide, congressional aide, Ted Cruz. 
um, who, who spoke to both of us um, in a little cafe near the State House in Austin about how we were going to hell. So he too, like Bernie Sanders, <laughs> has been very consistent with his views. Um, he came into he came into office on that wave of anger after Obama was elected. He came in not by a great margin, but a sliver, and has basically been running for the presidency ever since he was elected to the Texas Senate as a junior senator at the time. Um, he has run uh, his entire, he's passed less than 10, he's not actually initiated any laws in the Senate. Uh, he's passed and signed, um, I think, about 18 with a lot of writers, all of them associated with, he, his stance on uh, LGBT issues isn't nearly as virulent as his stance on women's reproductive rights, which is where I have the biggest issue with him. He's one of the guys that, in 2010 and again in 2014, it was very much, you know, abortion should be illegal in all cases. And he very recently took it to the next level of including rape. So my dislike of him has more to do with that than LGBT issues. He was very much against the, you know, you know between the 2012 election, um, marriage equality was actually a lot more front and center than it is in this current election cycle. Everybody was taking a side on it. Um, and he was one of the front runners with uh, Huckabee on, you know, it's between a man and a woman. Uh, he's kind of backed off with that once the Supreme Court case, you know, no one wanted to touch that on the GOP side. Now it's fully focused on, on reproductive rights for him. So his, his voting record on that in, in Texas was pretty, pretty aggressive. He did a lot of fundraising two years ago. Um, to bring down, to bring in uh, the new governor of Texas so that they could start to censure uh, Planned Parenthood and close a lot of the, the uh, abortion clinics there. He was very successful. He was a very good candidate <coughs> for down ticket candidates, especially from the evangelical side. Um, currently, though, uh, he, he, like Bernie Sanders in a sense, was a dark horse. You know, he's not very much liked in the Senate because he's as disagreeable to the uh, rank and file Republicans as he is to the Democrats. Um, everyone I think on the planet knows he shut down, he led the, the movement to shut down the US government in 2011, uh, <laughs> which brought us to the brink of what they called the nuclear option that the country was about to throw up its hands and say, we just aren't gonna spend and pay anybody anything. Um, so that, I mean, that's, that's, that's kind of good news, but, but in his favor, um, and I can't believe I'm saying that. Um, <laughs> in his favor, uh, he is, if he got elected, would be the first Hispanic. He would be a Hispanic Cuban of origin. His father, who is also very evangelical, both of them have, over the course of their life, done a lot of the Christian activism for the poor. Um, they've done a lot of uh, Christian activism for the sort of things you would expect, charities to feed, charities to home, uh, to house homeless, all that sort of stuff. And they have been very consistent. He is, he is a politician, to be sure. Um, but I, you know, I, I can respect the guy because he actually believes what he's saying. And I think the reason that he overstayed Mark Rubio, over, over Huckabee, um, and, and even over Santorum, they were all in the primaries, I think he stood out with that crowd a lot more, even though he's kind of a distasteful guy, um, because he has had a very, very, very consistent message. Um, so, I don't know if I want him to be my president, but well, I can kind of get where he's coming from. What can you add to that? <laughs> Nothing good. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, any questions, I guess, about Hillary, about Ted Cruz? No. Um, Donald Trump. <laughs> okay. That's, that's two hours. Yeah, okay. Um, I, hmm, Donald Trump. It, his views on LGBT are less controversial than his other views. So that's one thing. Um, some say he's the most liberal of the Republican candidates on LGBT. Mostly that's because he tends to change his mind and say whatever he feels like at that moment, um, or be just vague. Um, but, but yeah, as compared to, let's say, Ted Cruz, who, you know, thinks we're all evil, uh, Trump, you know, just isn't quite sure. 
So you know, I, I, he he definitely he definitely is. Lady Gaga. I, okay, I know. But, I mean, I, did he know it? Right? You know. <laughs> like, he financed Trump University too, but yeah, did he know? <laughs> um, so, but still, his views definitely are not inclusive. We could never say that he's actually inclusive. Um, he still has been pretty much. He's kind of had a mantra against uh, being against gay marriage. Um, I mean, having said that, he's been. You can never say that Trump's consistent about anything, um, but but he's he's criticized other um, Republican candidates for taking money from from LGB from philanthropists uh, that are that are supporting LGBT rights, and and saying. But and he's never made any campaign promises around LGBT stuff. However, when um, the there's a. Republican group called Log Cabin, um, Cabin Log Cabin Republicans, yeah, which is which is a group that uh, um, that act that uh, are activists trying to get Republicans to be inclusive of LGBT. The Log Cabin Republicans looked at his 2002 tax returns and found out that he actually donated um, like twenty thousand dollars, ten thousand dollars to uh, to um, LGBT organizations. Uh, Gelson, which is the um, Gay, Lesbian, and Straight Education Network, and also to GMHC, which is in New York. It's like the, fir the world's first and the leading provider of HIV um, and AIDS prevention. He didn't, you know, he didn't actually directly, it was kind of like, like he didn't directly give the money to him. It was through a TV program called Celebrity Apprentice, where there's a TV show, and the person on the TV show like chooses the charity of their choice, but still that person chose it, and, and actually the check came from Trump. So, you know, again, like everything, he tends to kind of change his mind whenever it's convenient, or he just doesn't remember what he says, and he doesn't really care. Really, I mean, like, like, I think that's the defining feature of Trump, is that he doesn't really care about anybody but Trump. You know, uh, he really doesn't. So, so in any given moment, and on any given issue, it's hard to say that he's actually pro or against, it's just kind of like, what's good for Donald, right? Um, in, 2000, in 2000, because he was considering running um, on the Reform Party ticket, and, and he was interviewed by Advocate Magazine, this is LGBT Magazine, and he, at that point, he said that he supported amending the 1964 Civil Rights Act. So this is like, also 15 years ago, he was in favor of adding LGBT people um, and saying that people shouldn't discriminate against it. So that's the thing, is that sometimes he will in a strange moment, say something, and, and mostly it's because he doesn't care, right? It's like, that doesn't concern me, I don't care, sure, let's not discriminate against them. Again, not to be confused with actual support, but it's better than being against. Um, so, you know, lately he's not really been asked publicly that I know of, you know, about these comments that he made 15 years ago, but uh, before he even said, you know, he's He's really good for making quotes, so I have a few quotes, you know. But, but he said, you know, that it's, that he he feels that gay people should have the same protection that everyone else in America should. It's only fair. Um, and he, he thought that uh, domestic partnership should be okay. And I don't know if it's just because he was talking to an LGBT magazine that he was just like, yeah, sure, it's fine, whatever. And then he just left the room, you know. But he's on record as saying this kind of stuff. Um, what else? Lately, like the, when we look again at the kind of what, what specifically he's kind of said or done in the last year, year and a half, uh, last June, then he was interviewed on CNN's State of the Union, and he was asked, um, which is kind of an odd question actually, he was asked how his three marriages fit into the definition of traditional marriage, you know, because he's saying, I'm for traditional marriage. And um, his, you know, a kind of typical Trump response was, that's a good point. Right. So, um, <laughs> you know, he was trying. To, they were trying to ask him. You know, he said yes, that was my fault and everything. But he was. They were trying to ask him what he would say to a gay person uh, about this. You know, the saying like you're opposing gay marriage and saying this should be traditional and what you've been in three marriages. And his answer was, I don't say anything. I'm just for traditional marriage. So this is like again a typical Trump response to a direct question. He sort of says like some strange answer. Um, September 2005. Then you know Kim Davis, who was the the clerk who refused to issue marriage license after it became um, federally legal to have same-sex marriage. Then Kim Davis refused to 
went to jail, she kind of became a little bit of a celebrity. So when he was asked about, that was in, in Kentucky, when he was asked about this, then again, in a kind of Trump way, he said, oh, that's a messy situation. <laughs> so he, he's very good at not really stating anything. Um, you know, he said, he said I, I hated it, but she's out now, and you know, we're a land of laws, and I think she should get a different job and let the clerks do that kind of job. So, so again, he kind of was in favor of the fact that it sort of sounded like he was upholding the decision and that she should do her job, but said it's really messy, and I embrace both. I embrace both sides of the argument, um, and he said you can embrace both sides of an argument. So again, very Trump. Uh, in November two thousand three, talking about about gay marriage, then he said he thinks he's evolving, if that's possible. Um, since but that's also a very pop, very a very popular thing. You know, it's like Obama's talking about I, I'm evolving, so Donald Trump now says he's evolving. Uh, he says he thinks he's a very fair person, um, but I have been for traditional marriage, I am for traditional marriage, and I still think that it's, so it's not very difficult, let's say. Um, but at the same time, then in 2011, a couple of years before, then he very adamantly said to, you know, this is in Des Moines in, in Indiana to a non-LGBT publication, then he just says they shouldn't be allowed to marry or get the same benefits as heterosexual couples. So, um, still, he's, he's slippery, I would say. Um, however, when okay, um, when when he's he's been specifically asked, like, okay, would you in your administration have an LGBT person? And his answer to that, again, it's it's quotable even because it's strange. Because he would say he just said, I would want the best and the brightest. Sexual orientation would be meaningless. So again, that's kind of the best you get out of Trump is that he says, I don't care. He said that, but but in that sense, it's interesting. You know, he said. Uh, I'm looking for brains and experience. If the best person for the job happens to be gay, of course I would have found him. Uh, when he was asked about whether companies should be able to fire employees just because they're gay, then he, he, he doesn't think that it should be a reason, so that's kind of positive. Um, and even though the human rights campaign you know, says he's very unclear on the issues, then there are LGBT people who come up in, in, in support of him. There was one guy um, who tried to buy the domain name Gays for Trump and found out that it was already taken. <laughs> so so, it, so it's, it's, it happens. So that's more or less Donald Trump. Uh, next one. Does anybody have any questions about it? Would you say the, the if Trump gets elected, then can he be a, a, a threat for LGBT community? I mean, because Trump is very flexible um, and it depends on the popular opinion, right, what he does. And uh, in a situation where uh, the majority of, in Congress is Republican, do you think that he can, you know, make any harm for uh, LGBT people? Paul, I can tell you're back here, like, go ahead. Um, of the GOP candidates, I think he's the least threatening to the status quo. Um, Trump, Trump, um, if he was elected president, A, I think he would get bored with a job and whoever his VP was is going to be running the country anyway. Mm -hmm. um, but, but Trump is the kind of guy that would oppose what Congress wants just to oppose what Congress wants. <laughs> the GOP is not going to be, I mean, that's why they're afraid of him. Because if he became president, he's not going to be a Republican president. He's going to be a Trump president. It would be like, you know, it would be Celebrity White House. It would be Donald Trump all the time, 24-7. Um, but even though, even though he has been very flexible on the issue, I mean, once upon a time, the man was Democrat. There's a nice Im uh, interview uh, that he did with a uh, uh, Saturday Night Live, of all things, talking about, you know, two guys getting married and only the sort of good religious crazy people are, are, you know, the ones afraid of it. So his opponents have tried, especially early on, and especially in 2012, tried to hit him for his liberal background. But the truth is, he's an old 60-something-year-old guy who wants a top job, so he'll say what he needs to say. Um, but I still think he would be a dangerous president for completely different yeah. issues. Not, not LGBT would be like the least of the problems. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Again, Trump only cares about Trump. 
So I think that's why at least the Republicans are probably more scared of them than the others. Um, anything else? John Kasich. So like Cruz, John Kasich is a current, uh, he's an Ohio governor, and um, he's, he's going the traditional path. And once upon a time, there was, you could only be a, get to the White House if you were governor of another state. Um, it's like being a mini president. Um, Kasich is, uh, he's, he's loved and hated in Ohio. In Ohio. He's very much uh, a career politician. He has recently... That was career, not queer. Yeah. <laughs> career politician. I um, heard career politician. <laughs> yeah, like, career what? Politician. <laughs> um, he, he does have that strong evangelical Christian background. He comes from the Midwest, from Ohio, the, the sort of Bible Belt area. Um, but he is generally a centrist in all issues but LGBT and women's rights. He is a centrist economically speaking, he's a centrist uh, on foreign policy, he's a centrist on economic issues in terms of helping uh, the poor with social programs, but, but he's got a blocker that he has had his entire career when it comes A, to women's reproductive rights, which like Ted Cruz, he is very, very virulent against. He's, he's just spearheaded a bill to shut down all of the, the Planned Parenthood that is in Ohio. Um, he's very much abortion under all circumstances not good. Very much against uh, LGBT rights. He's one, you know one of the problems with American politics is because it is an indirect democracy. Local government often has a greater effect on people's personal lives in the, the federal elections, but people tend to turn out less for local elections. Um, he's done a lot. Uh, to fight bills for anti-discrimination laws. He is very much in support of the Freedom of Religion Act. Um, and he was considered, you know, uh, someone who was going to be out of the, the process if he hadn't won Ohio. But he won Ohio big, and he's kind of getting a, a resurgence because this, the rank and file GOP are looking at Casey going, why don't we get behind him sooner? Because the, the GOP doesn't really want Ted Cruz or Donald Trump. Um, but in my opinion, he's actually in that class of Ted Cruz as being a guy who could do more harm to him and, and LGBT rights than Trump or the other guys, the down ticket guys combined, because he's very much a true believer. Um, that's what I can say about Casey. Okay. Uh, any questions? Trying to keep it all in LGBT. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Trying to go on his stance about closing factories and all that other stuff. That's <laughs> yeah, we'd be here till, till next Tuesday. Um, so, uh, Gary Johnson. Uh, I don't know. So, so basically, maybe, maybe now's a good time. So we've talked about the two uh, nominees for Democratic position, and one of them are going to get it. And right now, right now, according to the delegates, it's extremely close. Um, but again, the delegates... Who are, who are dedicated delegates, promised delegates, um, even they don't actually have to vote for who they've promised they'll vote for. Um, and then there's these super delegates that out of about 4,700 delegates, then 700 of them, about 7, 750, are what are called super delegates, which are not really attached to anybody. They, when they have the Democratic nomination, they get to be seated first, and they can vote for who they want. <laughs> the Democratic no, no, we are, we are. Yeah, we don't. Yeah. I mean, theoretically, the Democratic Party came up with this idea of the super delegates to try and be fair to grassroots activists, so that the other delegates, like if there were a bunch of elected officials, then they wouldn't automatically become the delegates. Um, but yeah, it just sounds like like Illuminati, really. Um, so so basically. Right now, even though the according to the delegates, then then Clinton and uh, Sanders are, are really really close, and we're kind of you know getting closer and closer to, to June to, to to convention time, then then still it's really unsure who's going to be the Democratic uh, nomination nominee. Um, out of the Republicans, again, we have three candidates, and, and and whoever whoever loses goes home, right, more or less. Yeah, more or less. <laughs> <You> know, <laughs> Hope, you know, maybe someone else will pick up their will pick up their votes. Um, sometimes, you know, if you are a Democratic Democrat during now during the primaries, then you're you might be you know staunchly for Bernie or staunchly for Hillary. But as soon as one of them becomes the candidate, then a lot of Democrats will, Democrats will say, okay, 
I'll just go for whoever is Democrat, because um, the third party candidates tend to be so small that they're not really seen as realistic. Um, and you know, if you're really Democrat, then voting for Republican quite often just you know, seems wrong. Um, so out of the, the three Democratic or the three Republican candidates that are still on the table, then uh, it's not quite as clear because because Trump has very publicly and loudly said that if he does not win the, dem uh, the, the nomination, then he's going to run as an independent, uh, which could that would break the party. Yeah, it would break the party because because he would you know he says that uh, at least you know he's done some recent polls at least sixty percent sixty eight percent of his his supporters would come with him, so that would make it almost impossible for any, for him or any other Republican to, to win. So in that sense, then it's, it's an interesting time. But in terms of the delegates, I forgot, like right now in, they're also really kind of split, like who, who is winning in the primaries. Well, Do you remember? Trump is still like that. Uh, yeah, it's six or seven hundred delegates, I can't remember all Yeah, it's like seven, seven, fifty. Yeah, and then Cruz is second. Yeah. But in, in many election cycles, it's very obvious, like like in February, you know, who's going to be the candidate, and then it's just sort of rubber stamping it. And here, not only is it not obvious, but I think it's you know a lot of people are pretty nervous if he's saying like, look, um, if you don't if you don't honor my delegates, then then I'm going to rip you apart. So. Um, Fair, the same thing is kind of happening in the Democratic Party. Hillary is ahead by quite a margin in terms of the delegate count and the popular vote count, but the fear amongst the, even the Democratic Party right now is that if Sanders does not get the nomination, his camp is not going to vote as much for her as if he gets it and Hillary's camp will vote for him. There's a big concern that the Sanders guy, the Bernie Bros are called, uh, will go run to Trump. Or, or possibly to or, like Jill Sanders, who's a Green Party, or something. So, so again, I don't know if you have like the idea that like as a the the big brothers of the Democratic Party are just um, still worried that. Well, because it's happened before. I mean, I think the whole planet realizes, and you know, not to wax too American here, but you know, if if Ralph Nader had pulled those that delicate and popular vote. Had George Bush or W. Bush, and we probably would have had two successive Gulf Wars, uh, well, one Gulf War, one Afghanistan War, and the situation we're in. So these little, you know, it, 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 some circles do argue that Ralph Nader, as a Green Party candidate during that election, did pull all the votes because the count, the popular count, was 492 people between Al Gore and George W. Bush. 492 people, and it went to count, and it went to a recount, and it went to court, and Florida, the state that the presidential candidate's brother was governing, doesn't sound like anything fishy there. Um, I don't actually think it was. I just think that was how it played out. Um, but but those, those, those small numbers can actually have a big effect. So if, if, if uh, Trump pulls, and here's like the complete nightmare scenario going on right now. If Trump pulls, uh, you know, a way to an independent, and if there's no actual majority vote, uh, then it becomes sort of like a parliamentary system in America because no one has an actual majority. Even our Congress can actually pick the president. For a long time, we were worried that Paul Ryan would do it. Now we're worried that Mitt Romney would be the guy that Congress picked. All of which are nightmare scenarios for all seven billion people on the planet. Trust me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so. Uh, our last two candidates are, are independent candidates, which for some people in America, they say, ah, they're just independent candidates, they don't even know who they are, they're not really important. But again, the fact that um, sometimes, even if they steal uh, a couple of percentages of the votes, then it can actually make a big difference. So, um, Gary Johnson, he's a libertarian, which more or less means he believes in no government. Not exactly no government, but his basic, the basic stance of all libertarians is that um, the less government, the better. Yeah, yeah. Um, again, the kind of theoretical position of a libertarian is no taxes and as little, like literally as minimal government as possible. Um, he was, uh, Gary Johnson was the governor of New Mexico for two terms. So again, he's a governor uh, who's uh, 
uh, he ran as a libertarian candidate in 2012. He got okay, 1% of the vote. Doesn't sound like a lot, but it was over a million votes. Uh, in general, in the states, to be a third party candidate, it's really, really hard because you have, they have to fight to get on the ballot in all of the states, and in order to be in the um, um, debates, then they have to poll over 15%, which is quite a lot. And if they don't, if they don't get, if the polls don't say that they um, are 15% popular, then they just are not allowed any kind of polling platform. And because Americans don't read anything, they just watch TV, then if you're not on TV, then no one even knows what your face looks like, and so nobody knows, and you're, you know, you're really, really unlikely to get elected. It's, it's almost impossible. So, for example, uh, Gary Johnson, along with the next candidate, Jill Stein, you know, which is Green Party, then they're even working together now to try and, and change these rules so that maybe the next time, then some kind of third party candidate could be even involved in the debates to have a different kind of voice. So, so Gary Johnson, you know, ran last election cycle and lost, uh, but he, you know, and he's been doing it again because for him, you know, he has no delusions of grandeur. He doesn't think he's going to win. He's um, hoping that he this time he gets five percent and just has a platform to like tell everyone about the libertarian position, right? So that he kind of boosts his party. Um, before, he, he announced his candidacy in January, and at that time he stepped down from his. Uh, position as the director and CEO of a marijuana marketing company, um, which you know it's it's legal in a number of states. But just when I read that, I was like, huh, okay. Um, <laughs> um, but you know, this is a kind of typical kind of position where it's like there shouldn't be any rules, nothing should be illegal, the free market should rule everything. Um, so just in a kind of general way, that's that's where he believes. Uh, in February, he just. In February, he called Trump a pussy. He's, <laughs> which just like that, you know, again, it's more actually maybe relating to, to gender discrimination or something. But still, when I, again, when I heard that, I was like, oh, okay, that kind of tells you what kind of guy he is. But it was in relation, you know, he's, he's a mountaineer, he's a marathoner, he's, he's a pretty tough athletic guy. And, you know, but he, he twice, he was like, he not only called Trump a pussy on, uh, in a, a public, uh, interview, but then later when he was explaining it, he was like, yeah, I call Trump pussy. Okay, great. Um, so, uh, apart from his, you know, in general, the libertarians believe that, you know, even whether, whether it's about gun control or women's rights or anything, that the government should more or less not regulate anything. Uh, in terms of LGBT rights, he did in 2013 when the um, Proposition 8, which is from California, which was kind of part of the backstory to the Defense of Marriage Act, um, being a part of it being overturned, then he, along with some other people, then he he was signing something saying that he didn't, you know, believe that Proposition 8 um, denying marriage to people in California, same-sex people in California, shouldn't be on the on the books. Um, in 2008, uh, then when there was another proposition before that, that defined marriage, I guess it's more about California stuff. So he he was, I don't know exactly why he was commenting on stuff in California when he was in New Mexico. Well, I think it had to do with the people who were behind Prop 8. Um, they were, there was a lot yeah. of who came from Utah and from New Mexico. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. So, um, so yes, so he's kind of come out against uh, against that. Uh, 2011, he kind of reluctantly said that uh, that gay marriage is okay. Um, he he said that you know religion basically, and again from a libertarian point of view, he said religions and people of faith um, shouldn't have the government interfering with them. So it's less of a really an endorsement than saying again kind of like Trump. It's none of my business, and you should be able to do what you want. And that, but also saying that all Americans should have the same protections. You know, if we're gonna if we're gonna have a law, it should be fair. So that's at least okay. But even in 2010, so six years ago, he wrote a, an, an op-ed piece for the Huffington Post uh, about advocating for the end of "Don't Ask, Don't Tell." So he was saying that, that you know, while virtually all other significant military powers in the world have lifted their ban on gays without anything drastic happening, then, then America's kind of behind the, behind the times. Um, I 
think. You know, there's not there's not much else I don't know um, that I that I found specifically about LGBT, um, but more or less he he seems like you know he's not the kind of guy who would try to overturn um, the marriage equality. He he doesn't seem like he's particularly pro, but he seems like a kind of safe, neutral um, candidate that, that would just keep his hands off because that's very libertarian. The thing about Gary Johnson, though, because the Libertarian Party, their, their, their patron saints are the Pauls, Ron and Rand Paul. Who, when Ron, when Rand Paul, before Rand Paul was Kentucky Senator Rand Paul, he was an actual registered Libertarian before he registered Republican. And Ron Paul was always considered kind of a Libertarian by definition, even though he was caucusing and running and, and was a registered uh, Republican. Uh, there was a shift, I think, in the Libertarian Party around 2007-2008 when Rand Paul actually pivoted against sort of the LGBT community, not necessarily for any other reason that I can see, because he also pivoted kind of against some, some racial issues at the time as well. Um, but he made that pivot, and, and it seemed like the Libertarian Party kind of fractured a bit. Because Jesse Ventura used to be a libertarian until they moved over a bit too far in what he considered the right. So I think I think Gary Johnson right now is trying to get back to the heart of what the Libertarian Party is, which is small government, everything should be equal, no one should pay taxes, let the roads fall apart. It's all kind of wacky stuff to me, but at least he's a bit of a purist. Um, and Jill Stein, she's she's Green Party, um, and. Uh, and, and to sort of what the panel was saying, I would say that there have been, in my lifetime, there have been two candidates, third party candidates, that really got a lot of press. Um, one was before anyone in this room was probably born, uh, which was uh, Anderson from the, the Carter, he was third party uh, candidate during Jimmy Carter, um, Anderson, I forget his first name, and uh, Ronald Reagan, he got a lot of press because he, he was kind of libertarian, but more on the left side of the libertarian, and of course the biggest one who was H. Ross Perot, who basically just financed his, he was a billionaire, he just bought all the air time he wanted, and he was the first uh, that actually got on the debate stage, and, you know, Saturday Night Live had a field day with making fun of him. So, so third parties, and then the third one, of course, who didn't make the debate, but certainly had a lot of attention, was Ralph Nader, because Ralph Nader was a, you know, fairly popular public figure at the time. Now, Jill Stein, who is the same party as NATO, the Green Party, I actually like her a lot. Um, if, if she were viable, she'd probably be my candidate um, because she has, she's a, she's a doctor, she's a practicing uh, a physician, um, and she deals with internal medicine, and she's been very much in women's rights and LGBT community in Massachusetts from a grassroots level forever, from the very, very beginning, especially uh, during her <coughs> early pre-med days when HIV and AIDS was happening. She was there in the field. Um, in terms of all her other policies, economics, uh, foreign policy, those sort of pale to what is my big issue next to LGBT, which is green energy. And she is running, like Gary Johnson, under no illusion that she will get a nomination, but her platform is basically Rebuilding infrastructure, the New Deal from, from uh, a sort of modified version of the New Deal from the post depression period of uh, FDR and renewable energy. So she's very much consistent on that message. She ran before in 2012 <coughs> and formed her committee to run this time because she actually got more votes. She was the highest uh, number of votes for a female candidacy during that period. Uh, the primary uh, candidates, remember Michelle Bachman and all the others, uh, she got half a million votes. Um, and the Green Party itself actually does have a delegate. So if she gets enough of their attention, uh, enough attention, they they have their own convention, they have their own delegate count. She could theoretically, and as was said with uh, Ralph Nader, be a viable third party candidate. Um, right now, she's got the majority of their, their whole bunch of actually, they're like, eight or nine Green Party candidates running, and she's number one. There's an insurgency guy who's coming up, and he's got 
maybe two of the uh, four or five of the delegates. She's got like 15 of the Green Party delegates. So, so I actually am. I could be her campaign manager. I do like Jill Stein. She's a good person. Um, that's all I can say about that. Okay. Uh, Alan, you're I just realized that I forgot to say something about Hillary. Um, but it makes me, uh, uh, I, it, when I heard, was reading this about Hillary, then it made me curious what, how Bernie stands on it. And I, I imagine they both, as both of the Democratic candidates, they probably both would, would agree to this. But it was just when I was looking at what, uh, what Hillary was promising. You know, it's like, when I become president, I will. And she, she said that she, uh, she'll um, not only sign the Equality Act, but that she would cut off federal funding for adoption agencies that refuse same-sex couples. Um, that she would address the crisis of transphobic violence and to cap expenses for HIV and AIDS drugs. And the reason why that's seemed, because a lot of the other discussion, especially about the Republican candidates, is just um, the, the discussion focuses on gay marriage. You know, whether you're for it, whether you are against it, whether you want to change it. And it just seemed like, at least for Hillary, then, then she has a much more kind of comprehensive, it's not only looking at marriage rights. Um, as the end all and be all to everything. She's looking at adoption rights, she's looking at transpho trans transphobia um, and transgender rights, and also at kind of HIV and AIDS awareness and treatment. And I mean, is it similar to Bernie no, just no, also? That's, that's part of the issue with Bernie right now. So Bernie, um, in terms of his, and he's very popular, especially amongst middle class gay men, he's very popular. Um, <laughs> his focus has been on strictly defense and defense of marriage, uh, marriage equality. Um, he hasn't delved into health care until recently, and I think it was in reaction to what Hillary's plan was, mm -hmm. because he tied it to the complete restructuring of Obamacare, to mm -hmm. single payer. Um, but he is not, I mean, that's, that's a legitimate weakness of his. He's not had, he doesn't have a specific platform for that, he doesn't have a specific platform on, you know, urban, uh, urban, uh, urban renewal plans like Hillary does. So she is, the reality is Hillary has a track record that's far in advance of all the other characters in this theatrical production called the American <laughs> Presidential Election, um, of working hand in hand with both the African American, Hispanic, women's community, and the LGBT community. Um, the problem is Hillary is messy. Um, and it has shown and it has dogged her her whole career. But she her record is the strongest mm -hmm. in terms of actual legitimate policy that she's tried to put forth and put forth, including the bad policies. So. Yeah. Okay. Those are the candidates. Um, do we have any any questions or hot items? Good. Um, so, so, okay, we've got the candidates. So now what is the current situation for LGBT voters and organizations? Um, for me, I was looking at this and there are kind of three, three basic issues. One is that kind of relates to everybody, but I thought we'd talk about it a little bit, is looking at, at kind of voter suppression uh, and, and how um, does this or how does this affect LGBT community? Uh, also kind of looking at um, Vote, which relates to voter turnout. So maybe we can just start with that. So um, in relation to voter suppression, first of all, can you, can you more or less explain what we talk about when we're talking about voter suppression? Well, one of the results of sort of, and this has gone back to even before Obama, 2004 election when Jim Kerry was running for president, uh, there was a lot of uh, congressional redistricting. And in that redistricting, you see the result of a Congress that has very small communities, represented by special interests of the far right. Um, but in terms of popularity, the popularity, uh, the popular vote has never really supported in the past 20, 25 years the Republican Party. Redistricting changed that. Now to fight, to also sort of support this redistricting, a lot of states have changed voter laws. Um, they have challenged the civil rights, uh, the voter registration laws. They've come up with these ridiculous some qualifications that you need to, to vote, especially in the, the southern and rust belt states, um, in terms of identity, all in the name of fighting voter fraud, which just didn't really exist as a problem before it was a major problem uh, by the people wanting to get these laws in place. Uh, and, and right now, so Jill Stein is going to be in South Carolina at the end of this month. In South Carolina, 
by North Carolina, um, and, has, and this is something the news just doesn't talk about, um, it, it is creating a, a problem for LGBT, uh, for transgender people, especially transgender people of color, because they don't have the proper ID or what they would claim to have the proper ID because they're closing down the, the DMVs where they get the IDs and they, and they get the IDs. You know, the transgender doesn't have their transgender identity as their primary identity, but the clerk at the DMV is not acknowledging that because it's not legal because of another segment of voter suppression. So that's basically what it is, a, a way to keep sort of traditionally democratic voting blocks kind of from having easy access to voting. And, and a lot of this happened when, uh, unfortunately, under Obama, right after the 2014 election, a lot of these laws were changed, and some are still pending at the, the state level and federal level, um, but others are, have been upheld. I think Texas was the only voter suppression law that was successfully challenged, that was reversed. But North Carolina, South Carolina, um, Pennsylvania, which was a dark horse state, a lot of them still have uh, Okay, so um, so it used to be easier to register to vote, and now because they're demanding like more uh, robust documentation, then there's a lot of people again, particularly for the transgender community, where it's very difficult. Um, so and then so so maybe this is particularly affecting uh, transgender community, people of color, people in poor neighborhoods, people who and, would and not automatically have a driver's license. And the elders. In southern states, the elderly have been hit the hardest. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, if you've been retired for 40 years, uh, you haven't had a driver's license during that time, you don't have your birth certificate because a lot of places didn't have it. A lot of people over the age of 70 just don't have a birth certificate or a driver's license or a social security card, which are the three documents in North Carolina you have to have. Um, in North Carolina, the, what used to be the developing document U.S. passport is no longer enough to get a state ID. So, right. So, so how how do you think that is going to, or is, how would that affect voter turnout, and particularly LGBT, well, particularly LGBT voter turnout? Do you think, like, um, a combination between voter suppression, but also uh, the situation that's going on now with the candidates, do you think this is going to bring more people out? Are are people fighting to register, or are they just giving up and staying home? Well, um, two things that I've seen in North Carolina, because so I've got family in North Carolina, and I follow North Carolina, I used to live there. Um, two things I've seen in particular in North Carolina, amongst black youth and black middle class and black elderly, the turnout is actually getting higher because the traditional method of uh, southern black uh, voter registration, which is the Baptist church, has been very much active. Now, what I Survived from other people I've talked to there is that that is not translated to homeless, young, transgender, and LGBT kids who are especially not within the Raleigh or Charlotte area, but are more out in the smaller communities of Greensboro and Asheboro, which are kind of like Cheshire and Bidjobs, so they're little tiny places. Um, those communities are a bit more disconnected. So how about all of the, the, what you would call the kind of voting age population? So, so in general, I don't know if you guys know about how many people vote, but um, in, the last, uh, in the last decade, usually the turnout is about 50%. Um, during the 60s, it rose to 70, 60%, and in the, the, the highest it usually it was was in the 1890s, where it was 75%. But you know, it, probably globally, there's a, a whole thing with you know, kind of voter apathy and people not turning out for elections. So I just wonder, but, but still, you have like your, um, according to the census, what you would say, your voting age population, but then even out of, the, out of that voting age population, there's only a certain number of people who can or want to register to vote, because you have to be registered to vote before, you know, a certain time before voting. You can't just at the last minute say, ah, oh, I'm going to go vote. Um, so do you think in, in this election, maybe, so one issue about people turning out to vote is, is whether they can or not. But the other issue is whether they want to or not. Do you think that, that now, because of Bernie or Hillary, do you think that because, oh, we have marriage equality, so there's no reason to go turn out to vote, um, do you think that there's any issues or any candidates that are going to either make people stay at home or make people um, I think I actually think this will be a 
pretty robust turnout. Um, because this is, the 2016 campaign is actually one of the few campaigns in my life that I'm actually nervous about because the candidates are so far apart on so many issues. Um, you know, there, there is Bernie's version of social justice, there's Hillary's, there's the religious movement, um, there's the we're just angry and we're going to vote for Trump movement. Um, so, so I think a lot of these smaller grassroots groups are galvanizing. The LGBT community in particular, um, as we were discussing the other night, my sense is this is the first time the community has been this divided on a candidate. Mm -hmm. and, and it is a big divide. It's a divide beyond uh, social lines, gender lines, and educational lines. And it's, it's very, very, very obvious who are the LGBT people that are supporting Hillary and who are the ones supporting Bernie. And they are? Um, well, the middle class, you know, 25, educated to 35, white men are all behind Bernie. Mm -hmm. All my white male gay friends are like, go, go, Bernie. My gay friends are of color and my, my women, my lesbian friends, my transgender friends are all behind Hillary. That's just been read my Facebook feed, you know who I argue. <laughs> yeah. Huh? But they don't. Yeah. <laughs> but it's 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 a pretty and it's and it's not just within the LGBT community, it's just the community at large that demographic is pretty stark on the Democratic side and on the Republican side, um, you know, we can, we can just be blunt. There is a, a sector of people who are really rallying behind Trump and take the America back. Um, you know, we don't, want a, we don't want a woman or an old Jewish guy in the White House. They want it to go back to the old ways where it's a recognizable, strong, white, patriarchal figure taking care of us. And those are the ones who are yelling and screaming and fighting, and, and they will turn out. And then the evangelicals will also turn out. So I actually think because of the passion um, and because so much is emotionally at stake. Now, this is one of the funny things about this election. So the U.S. government, the U.S. economy, social issues are at a, a level where it's approaching stability, but the feelings within the country are so divided and are so angry about everything that I, I think the voter turnout will be better, bigger than it was in 2012. But, people, but to me, people who vote with their emotions are dangerous, so I'm worried. <laughs> I don't want a bunch of angry guys after seeing Trump on television the night before going into the, you know, election. Mm -hmm. That's dangerous. Okay. Um, I guess we have maybe like ten minutes, something like that. Um, so talking about, about about where the current situation is with LGBT voters, uh, who might vote, like if it's possible to vote. Um, LGBT organizations, particularly in the last election cycle, they were very, very, very vocal. And now they seem to have kind of quieted down. The human rights campaign, uh, even before uh, the primary started, when they endorsed Hillary Clinton, which is very unusual. But apart from, you know, so there's some, and, and she does have um, some endorsements, but apart from that, some of the more uh, well, hardcore activist groups, they just seem like they've kind of gone on, on silent. Do you have, like, what do you think about that, or, or why? Well, or how I, I, I think the HRC did behind HRC. I think, <laughs> <laughs> I think the Human Rights Commission did, the campaign did behind her actually silenced them, because they got vilified by Bernie Sanders after supporting her. When they came out for her, they were called sellout, they got, you know, celebrities talking bad about them. I actually think the reaction to their support of her silenced a lot of the other groups. They came out very early mm -hmm. in support of her, but their detractors came out very strong. And, and I, I felt, you know, this anecdotally, I don't know if anyone is actually tracking this data, but anecdotally, I think, I think there is a sort of fear within the traditional supporters of the Clintons and the LGBT community because of that. There was a time in a small organization, especially with, you know, when it was all about AIDS and HIV and, and uh, offensive marriage, pro and con, they were always there. And, and it's the first time they've not been, mm -hmm. that I heard about. Um, so, so how about... That's just anecdotal. Um, 
apart from apart from the LGBT organizations, the, then there there also are some kind of groups, for example, gays for Trump. Um, I think you also said that there's an African Americans for Trump, which yeah, just yeah, seems like an oxymoron. Yeah. <laughs> um, but stuff like you know, Caitlyn Jenner, um, Caitlyn Jenner is is come out for Ted Cruz. Um, what also, you... mind boggling. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's hard to imagine, but still. Um, I mean, I guess I'm just saying uh, the question with thinking about possibility that there can be, you know, the lesbian tech group that's behind Hillary Clinton and the gays for Trump. Is this just like another another thing that's showing how divided the community yeah, is, or good. or has it always been divided and now well, it's just getting more publicity and people are are, are seeing more? Well, I know where he's coming from. Uh, it, on a level below the surface, if you will, the gay community is as fighting, bickering, and not unified as any other community. But traditionally, when it came crunch time, these organizations got behind who they needed to get behind. It was always an era of compromise. You know, we, we, we fight this battle, even though it's not what we want to fight another battle. This time, I think, because there are no big ticket items, obvious big ticket items on, on the presidential level, um, the danger of getting behind the wrong person has sort of made some of the other organizations that would traditionally be there saying, go vote for so-and-so, a little bit more technical. Okay. Uh, any questions at this point? No. On the law cabinet still, over the court law cabinet, gay Republicans, think about that. Never have I understood them. They were behind Bush, one and two, they were behind Reagan. Yeah. yeah. Well, because they're Republicans, but they believe that Republicans should be inclusive of LGBT. So Caitlyn Jenner is a member of the Log Cabin Republicans, for example. And they're very, very happy about that. Because it raises their visibility 100,000%. Yes. Um, so, kind of the last area is like, okay, we talked about the candidates. We more or less talked about kind of voters, maybe where they where they might be uh, turning out or, or who they're supporting. But, but actually looking at the current political situation, what is actually at stake in this election cycle for LGBT people? You know, it's kind of like, how did we get here and where are we going? Um, can you talk a bit about the kind of going backwards is looking at the midterm ele uh, elections and how what happened in the midterm elections could affect, have affected LGBT issues. For example, some of the freedom of, uh, that's, that's had a knock on effect of the Freedom of Religion Acts, trans bathroom laws. Well, Again, it's, it's like I said, um, those midterms, all of us, you know, uh, Thomas Jefferson said, all politics is local. And, and this is very true in the midterms. Uh, when you elect your governors and your, and your, your state representatives, they're the people that are going to affect the laws, uh, to make the laws that affect your everyday life. For LGBT issues, it's freedom of religion. For economic issues, it's Scott Walker's, you know, fight against the unions. You know, in Michigan, it's the governor of Michigan's completely disbanding local governments. That's why we have the Flint, Michigan water situation, because there was no local authority to ban disband at all in that sense. Um, I think, the more I think about LGBT issues and, and women and trans issues in the LGBT community in particular, I think this election has probably greater effect and is, is more at stake in this election in a long time, especially because of the women's health issues and the trans issues. And my fear is that because those are sort of like secondary issues, especially with the LGBT community at large, um, it will have an adverse effect on, on the communities that are, that are out there. Like, like trans bullying is, is, is not something that should be an issue but because of all these local elections and these laws that have been changed because of the low turnout during the midterms and because of the laws that were put in effect because of the people governing these states, it's becoming an issue. Um, and, and that's kind of, you know, that's the, the thing that um, bothers me a lot about uh, this election. Um, America in particular is kind of here because of those 2014 elections. You know, the economic issues could have gone a lot further um, if we got more of a blue 
democratic, progressive government. So it is an issue. Um, kind of, to be quite honest, uh, as I look into Polish politics, that's what well, I fear here, I fear, you know. Too many people stayed home. Too many people didn't get out there. You know, everyone I know, especially in Warsaw, and even some people, you know, in Krakow and Jeshop, are like, what the hell is going on? How can this have happened? And then you look at the number of people who voted, the fact that the majority vote is not the majority of the country, and you go, okay, this is how parliamentary government works, and this is where you are. So, you know, governance, um, you know, America likes to build itself on active participation. You know, I've participated in four presidential campaigns, um, you know, twice for Clinton, and one time I was even in the service. Uh, and for Kerry, I participated. I was uh, volunteering for the authorities run in 2008 um, until I left. Uh, couldn't keep going back and forth between here and there. Um, so, you know, I, I take politics and political participation pretty seriously because it does affect our lives. Okay, so um, looking, looking at the next four years, um, let's assume that these third party candidates are not going to win. Um, then. Scary. <laughs> we let's um, you know the possibility that Trump would be a viable third party candidate, or or if it's just again normally it's uh, between the Democrats and Republicans. What kinds of apart from the candidates kind of uh, putting into action their plan, what other kinds of bigger issues is the president of the next four years going to be dealing with in terms of of LGBT issues? I'm particularly thinking about you know can you talk a little bit about about the Supreme Court and the Equality, um, the Equality Act. Um, well, right now we're missing a justice on the Supreme Court. So if they don't get Obama's guy on the Supreme Court, who's a pretty conservative guy, all things considered, um, the next president is going to get to choose this, you know, some sitting Supreme Court. It's a life, life position. If you get someone who's like Scalia light, um, then all these cases right now standing before the uh, Supreme Court that affect transgender, LGBT, women's rights, marriage equality, uh, death tax and adoption, there are a whole list of uh, kind of quiet LGBT issues backlogged to the Supreme Court that could have bad effects on people. Again, and this is really sad, it's mostly dealing with women's issues, with lesbian and transgenders, with adoption, with, with birth, and all that sort of stuff. That's very much, that's very much at stake uh, for the LGBT community. Um, something that is very, very underrepresented is um, the refugee status of LGBT people. LGBT people are being uh, of uh, Syrian or uh, Iranian or any of the Middle Eastern groups are being vilified. And if you're LGBT, it's even worse. Um, those issues are also going to be things affected by the next city president. So there's a lot of stuff at stake, but it's all dirty nuts for most politics. It's not you know, sexy, big, it's not big, sexy, uh, big, big issues. Yeah, issues. Yeah. But, but those are the things that actually affect the day-to-day -day lives of people. Okay. Um, you guys are very patient with an hour and a half in a hot room. Does anybody have... It is a bit hot. I know, it's, for me it's... Um, anybody have any questions, comments? That either means we put you to sleep or we covered everything. <laughs> Who will win? <laughs> I'd like to say Hillary Clinton. I'm going to say someone Congress elect. Uh, he thinks the, that the, the doomsday scenario is going to happen, <laughs> where um, where no no candidate gets. An, I mean, it's one of those things that, like you, you said, you had to go back and you know, this guy reads the Constitution just to, to make sure he knows on a daily basis what it says. So you had to read the Constitution again to to check what would happen if nobody gets enough votes. Because again, in most other countries, you know, Poland, England, um, you know, Italy, a lot of countries, it's like it's representational um, politics. Here, it's you know, winner takes all. But what happens if you have no wall? And so that's the kind of situation that's, we talked about yeah. is that there is, a, there is actually a strong possibility that no one will win. 
And what happens if no one wins? What happens is... Congress gets to pick the president. And that president does not have to be one of the candidates. It could be them. And that's why right now the Speaker of the House could say, I'm going to be the president. And that's why he actually came out on television this week and said, I definitely, 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 definitely am probably not going to run. <laughs> yeah, so usually, you know, when someone suddenly comes out on television and says, I'm totally not interested in a position, it should make you worried. So if, if there's no other questions, thank you very, very much.